Okay, so good afternoon. Just as, um, just as a reminder, uh, your first homework is posted to Blackboard here. Has anybody downloaded it and taken a look at it yet? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's really, honestly, this is probably um, the easiest homework you'll have all semester. So you, you'll want to really just do great on it to, to start off. Uh, after class today, you'll pretty much be able to do all of it, except I might not get to this thing called, um, this calculation called the sample standard deviation. Um, but we'll, we'll get to everything. Um, just looking at the outline real quick. Uh, the homework due date got moved. This is due Sunday. So I'll take any questions you guys have on it um, in a second. And then I'll also take any questions on Thursday. Um, we're a little behind on the um, course calendar. So our review day, we might lose 45 minutes of our review day. Um, just finishing up regression, but that's not a big deal. And then We'll still have at least an hour for review on review day. Um, but before I get started, uh, does anybody have any questions on the homework or any questions in general before I jump into the lecture? Oh yeah, I have a question, Professor. Sure. Um, you said that we can either take a picture of it and then upload it to Blackboard or, um, or was it like take a picture of it and email it to you? I, I have another math professor, that's why I'm a little. Uh, I don't I don't accept any work via email. Um, so just just upload it to Blackboard. Anything you do, just upload to Blackboard. As a PDF, um, correct? Yeah. Or you, when you go to submit your homework, um, you can submit like you can attach multiple files. You know, just by like holding Control on your keyboard. You know, to it. Um, so you can you can just save your pictures separately and then just in your document write you know see pictures separately um that's fine too thank you yeah no problem just make sure that's like a jpeg or just no mac files i just can't open mac files that's the big one all right no other questions before i get started Professor, I have a problem with um, uh, the frequency, relative frequency. Yeah, uh, here, yeah. Yeah, because I got like two over fifty-five when I divide it. Yep. I, I don't know, but my division, my thing, my total figure should be one, but I get one, one point zero one. Yeah. So, so I, how yeah. many, how many decimal places did you take everything out to? Um, first one I made two, but the next one I made three because I went That's over okay. the notes. It's like three. That's so okay. Wait, all you have to do is, um, it's okay in this this simple example here to fudge the numbers a little bit. So one number that you rounded up, just don't round up. Okay. That's it. Just just fudge it a little bit. That's okay. It's not uh, a big thank, deal. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just as Melissa said, if you just round round one group down, it's fine. Like it's not a not a big deal. Not a big deal at all. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other any other homework questions? Okay. So I think last class we did this uh, example by hand. This is exactly where we ended up. We 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 had this this problem. Uh, about manufacturer of ins insulation. We did the frequency, which is exactly on your homework. And then we drew a histogram. Does that ring a bell to what we did for people, what we did last week? Correct. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay, great. All right, so what I wanna do now, um, we're gonna, histograms are gonna come up a lot in this class. Um, and so there, there are some common shapes that histograms take on. And so I wanna talk about those common shapes and um, uh, give you some examples of like where you might see them, okay? So these are, after you've created a histogram, it's generally gonna take on, as I said, uh, one of these five shapes. And so the first common shape is what we call the normal distribution or the bell curve. Have people heard of the bell curve before? You might have seen it. it might, you might have seen it. it looks kind of like this. So 
So this this is the the shape you'll see of the, of a normal distribution or bell curve in a histogram. Like what I can do is I can superimpose on top of it this normal distribution. Okay, and it's not like a perfect fit, but it's really really close. Um, just as a, a heads up, we're gonna we'll spend a lot of time uh, reviewing. Uh, the properties of the normal distribution later on. Okay, so where where uh, where where might we see um, normal distribution? So if you were to look at the distribution of heights, let's say of adult males. Okay, so um, think about think about adult males in general. Um, so I'm about five ten. Would you guys say I'm about average height? If if I'm about five ten, five feet ten inches. Yes. Uh, okay. First off, no. You should say Matt. You're 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 tall, but fine. Okay. Uh, that's a joke. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so like, look, I'm, 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 I'm average height. So let's just say that the average height of adult males is five feet, 10 inches. Okay. It's probably like five, nine, five, eight. Uh, and then for full disclosure, I'm actually five, nine and a half, but I just tell me, tell everyone I'm five, 10. So if you think about, um, uh, heights of adult males, um, would you guys think like, you know, walking around the vast majority of people of adult males are pretty close to my height. And then think about this. Are there people who are like six five, six six, six seven? Are there people who are really tall out there in the world? Yeah, but are there a lot of people in the world who are, you know, six six, six seven, six eight? Yes. Well, so what I mean by that is, is as you as you get away from this height, there's less and less people than there are people who are at five foot ten. That's what that's what I'm hitting at. I mean, like, are there people? The further away you get from the average height, would you agree that there's more people closer to five ten than there are really really tall? Yes. Yeah, and it's the same thing on the other side. Okay, you know, as you get if you think about adult males, there are people who are you know five four or five two five three, but there's not as many as there are people who are 5'10". So the whole concept of a normal distribution is um, most data is centered around the mean, the average, and then you get less to each side. Okay. So that's, that's what a normal distribution looks like. It's just gonna be this bell curve shaped. Is everybody okay if I uh, um, go on for a little bit? Anybody need to copy anymore? Uh, go for it. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, here are two other common shapes. All right, and they're, and they're, they're, they're skew, when you notice skew in histograms. So it looks like, uh, let me rephrase that. There's something called a right skewed and a left skewed. And what it looks like in each case is it looks like you have a little bit of a bell curve shape and then a tail that shoots off to the end. So if the tail shoots off to the right, it's called right skewed. And if the tail shoots off to the left, okay, that's called um, left skewed. Now let me give you an example of um, something that I think is right skewed in the real world, okay. So let's talk about hours of TV uh, watched by adults each night. And, and watching TV also includes streaming services. Okay, things like Netflix and Hulu or Disney Plus, whatever. Uh, what is the least amount of TV that somebody could watch and when I say each night, what I mean really mean is each day, sorry. Total throughout the entire day. What's the least amount of TV somebody can watch? Yep, zero, Melissa has it. You can watch zero hours of TV, okay? 
What's the most amount of TV somebody could watch in a day? I mean, theoretically 24. So I'm just gonna put up here a lot, okay? Some ridiculous amount. So I'm just curious, do you know what, they, what the report is on the average amount of time that people spend watching TV is per day? Robert's pretty close. Three. Anybody got a different guess? I'm going to split Robert and Sarah there. You guys are you guys are right. Um, it's about four hours a day. Okay, so here's the average. About four hours. So my question for you is this: That's a lot of TV. Okay, that's a lot of TV. Do you think um, most people in the country watch more or less than four hours of TV a day? Think more? It's a lot of TV. I mean, there are a lot of people who watch a, a significant COVID. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, this doesn't take into account COVID. I forgot COVID. Um, so, it, the, so here's the thing. We do watch more TV than we realize, all of us, uh, myself included. Like yesterday, um, not, to, not to derail the conversation, but yesterday I spent a lot of time watching like... Um, Bloomberg business and Fox business and CNBC because some there was some interesting stuff going on in the stock market if anyone was paying attention to it. But most people in the country pre-COVID watch less than four hours of TV a night. And the reason it's skewed, the, the mean is so high, is because there's a number, there's a small number of super TV watchers, people who watch are watching six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours of TV um, a day. So you get this skewed because most people consume television in a reasonable amount of hours. And then there's a small number of super users that shoot it off to the right. Okay, and that'll be right skewed. Left skewed is just the opposite of it. Okay. Yeah, I would count Netflix into that as well. Yeah. Left skewed would be something like, um, Hours of sleep uh, adults get per night. Yeah, so the average is about seven. You know, um, most people in the country are getting between, you know, I don't know, five and 11 hours of TV or 11 hours of sleep a night. But then there are a small number of people who are just like not getting the, the, that amount of sleep per night. Okay. And it's not as many, you know, there's, you know, people who can survive on so little sleep, right? There's not that many of them as the people of us who are getting five to 11 hours of sleep a night. But anyways, just when you see these things, these tails, that just means there's a skewed histogram. Okay. So we're going to spend a lot of time in this class real quickly before I go on looking at things that have normal distributions like this or skewed distributions. Okay, these are the most common three that we'll, we'll work with in this class. There are two other ones that'll show up um, every once in a while, just so you can notice them um, when you see them. There's something called a bimodal distribution, okay, which looks like two normal curves thrown together. Um, you know, this happens, this happens quite often in a math class. Uh, like when I teach calculus and when I look at grade distributions on exams, it's a lot of times it's a bimodal. Um, there'll be a lot of students who get A's on an exam. And then there'll be a lot of students who get D's, F's and D's on exams, and then not many C's. That's a very common distribution, grading distribution that people notice. And then multimodal distribution is just when you have a bunch of bars going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And there's really no discernible um, distribution like a skew, like a left or right skew or, or a normal distribution. So something that looks like this, that's all over the place. We just call this a multimodal distribution. All right, but for our class, as I said, the, the main ones will be the right left skewed and the normal distribution. Okay, um, so what I wanna do now is um, a problem that involves reading a histogram, okay? Uh, you, you're, gonna have, you're gonna have to do this on your um, first exam. Um, and then it's also, I forget if it's on, I think it's on your second homework assignment, you're gonna have something that looks a lot like this, or maybe it's your first one, actually. I think it's your first one. It's the last question on the first homework. 
Um, okay. Yep. Thank you, Melissa. Yes. Yeah, the last question on the first homework. Um, sorry, I'm a little out of it today. Just so much shoveling and a kid at home. So yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay. So this is reading histograms. Um, so I got this histogram chart here. Okay. And what it looks like, and you have to pay real close attention to this. Okay. Along the, um, that's okay, Philip. Don't 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 worry about it. You know the recording will be posted. That's really nice of you helping a uh, neighbor. Um, okay, what you have to look at here along the side is this is a relative frequency histogram. Okay, so relative frequency is a proportion. Okay, of each count of each of each category, not a, not a count. Okay, so just remember these are proportions. All right, and so it says the histogram above shows the level of cholesterol. So this is cholesterol levels in milligrams per deciliter, okay? So these are your cholesterol levels. So this is your first category goes from 195 to 200 and then 200 to 205 and so on. Of 200 people, okay? So you know that there are 200 people in this histogram. All right, so the first question, how many people have a cholesterol level between 205 and 210. Does anybody have a guess in the chat how we could answer that? So just looking at this, how many people have a cholesterol level between 205 and 210? Close, Philip. Uh, close. Uh, okay, but so um, what Philip did, and then I'll talk about this for a second. Um, and I'll pause because someone has the right answer right there. Okay. It's 20 so, over 200. Uh, let me, let me, let me just pause for this. Okay. So it just says how many people, so you're going to go to 205 and 210. That's pitching, keep it. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> let me, let me, uh, let me uh, answer this one for us all. Uh, just so we can see, because there's a lot of different answers in there. All right. So how many people have a cholesterol level? between 205 and 210. So here's 205, here's 210. It's, would you guys agree that it's this bar here? Right here, it's this green bar, are all the people between 205 and 210? Okay. Yes. yes. Great. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna shoot across the side and the relative frequency is 0.2. So that means 20% of the 200 people, okay, have um, that cholesterol level. So it's 20% of 200. How can you find out what 20% of 200 is? This is the hard part. And if you actually, after you see me do it once, you'll be like, oh yeah, obviously. Well, all you would do is you would take 20%, turn it to a decimal and multiply it by 200. What's 0 0.20 times 200? And Melissa was the one who had it correct. Boy. Yeah. So that's how we did that that problem. Okay. So you just have to you have to be careful what I say here. If I give you the relative frequency here, that's proportions, and how you're going to change that to a number. So let's try this next one. Okay. How many people have a level of cholesterol less than 205? Okay. So here's 205. Less than 205 would be this bar and this bar here. Okay. These two. So this first one, this green bar here is 0.05 and the second bar here is 0 0.05, okay? Exactly, so Brianna has it, yep. And, and Jamie has the answer. So it's 15% of 200. Do you guys hear my little guy in the background there? Yes, how old is he? Uh, seven months, it's his nap time. What's his name? His name is William, named him after my dad. Nice. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a cute kid. Uh, so I just wanna pause and just say something. So as the semester goes on, his nap time is always sometime between like 12.30 and 1.30, maybe two at the latest. So every, every class you guys are gonna hear him. So I wish, you know, COVID stuck at home. So sorry about that. Don't, don't apologize. <laughs> Yeah, no, I appreciate that, but thank you. 
Oh, well, William, my poor wife, I feel bad for her. All right, so let's try this one. What percentage of people have a level of cholesterol more than 215? So here's 215. More than 215 is this bar and this bar here. So if you look up to the top here, this green bar is 0 0.25. Uh, you got to be careful um, with this one. 0 0.05 is this blue bar. Now, hold on. Did I ask for people or percentage here? Yeah, see, people are getting it. I asked for the percentage. So more would be this plus this, which would be 30%. So you just have to, um, you just have to pay real close attention to to, to what's being said for these problems. Like, especially when you see it on your exam and your homework. All right, let's try this one. How many people, so now it's back to a how many people question, have a level of cholesterol between 205 and 220? Well, here's 205 to 220. So it's this bar, which is 0 0.2, this bar, which is 0 0.35 and this bar here, which is 0 0.25, okay? So Melissa, to get that answer, how did you do it? I added the relative frequency, which came to 0 0.8, and then multiplied that by 200. And that's exactly how Melissa got the 160 there. Woo! Yeah, woo! So now that you see me tackle this problem with the relative frequency, does it not seem too bad? What do you guys think? I'm going to need a quick run through one more time. Yeah. How about I do a different one a little bit? Yeah, I don't know. That's what, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Let me switch to, let me switch to this one here. And uh, let me, before I go on, is everybody okay if I move on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this one's a little different. Now you have to pay attention to what's being said here. Okay. So I'm not going to give this away. So what I like to do every once in a while is I'm going to put this problem up here. And it says the histogram below shows the height in centimeters, the height distribution of 30 people. And just, just as a quick review, when you see this histogram, um, how might you classify this histogram? Like right skewed, left skewed, normal? Left skewed. Uh, so the, the tail shoots off to the... Oh, right, the right, right skewed. Yep, yep. So it, is, it looks like a right skewed history. Right. All right, so why don't you guys take two minutes. Just I'm just going to do a real quick two minutes. Take two minutes and see if you can um, answer these, these problems, okay? These four problems here. And I'll go on mute for two minutes.
All right, so these, these problems can be tricky, you know? So I'll give you a couple more seconds, you know, to work on it. Um, but I hope after you see me do this one, it's a little bit more like, oh, okay, I got this. All right, you guys ready to see me see me tackle this one and I'll do it with your guys' help? Yes. Okay, all right. All right, so the first question here, the first thing you gotta look at is um, along the side here, okay? You see that it's frequency, okay? So it's a different problem than the previous one, okay? So these numbers here are the counts, okay? So it, sometimes it might even help to do this. This first group, this yellow one has six individuals in it. This green one has nine. This next yellow one has seven. This green has five. Is everyone seeing how I'm doing that? Yes. This one has two. And then this last bar has one person in it. All right, so how many people have heights between, uh, let's see, 159.5 is here and 169.5 is here. So it's just this yellow bar here, because that's what falls between it. So how many people is, yep, seven, piece of cake. Okay, how many people have heights, let's see, less than 159.5? So that would be this green bar. Yep, you guys got it. And this yellow bar. So six plus nine gets me 15. Let's see how many people have heights more than 169.5. So. Yep. Wow. You guys got it. Yep. So here's 169.5. So more would be five plus two plus one. Gets me eight. All right. Now here's the tricky one. Uh, at least I think, uh, let's see what percentage of people have heights between. So it's between here's 149 and, and then all the way to uh, 179.5. So it's this box here that I have. Huh. Okay. So I have no idea how to do that. What do you guys think? It would be this bar, this bar, and this bar. You add them up first. Which is how many? 23. Okay. So, yep. Uh, let's see. I don't think you get 23, right? Because it stops here, right? Sorry. Yeah, 21, right? Because sit nine plus seven is 16 plus five. Sorry, I think I, I made it look like you included that one. No problem. So it would be 21. And then how many people are there? Total. Yeah, so to find a percentage, you just divide. Okay, and what do you get there? You get 70, you get 0 0.70, which changes to 70%. Yep. So here's what I encourage you to do on your homework, try your homework problem. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, see if you got it and then come to class on Thursday and I'll answer any questions you guys have on it. I, I'll even be, um, I'll even be willing to work the problem if a lot of people are having trouble with it. Okay. Sound okay. So I just want to talk, um, just kind of rehash some things that are, that are really important before we move on to the last uh, bit of visual representation. <clears throat> so this class, we're looking at two different things that you can have two different types of data. Okay, you can have population data, okay, or you could have sample data. So remember population data includes all possible values. In sample data, what this is, is just a subset of a population. And so what's like, what's one of the great features about sample data and, and why are we gonna spend so much time talking, not a lot about population data, but, but sample data. And so, well, and this will all make sense in a second. Um, 
when you have population data, the distribution of population data is called the population distribution or the distribution of the variable. This is the uh, this is like the overall distribution of the data. And the distribution of the sample data is called a sample distribution. Okay, so how did these two, so how are a population distribution and a sample distribution related to each other? So this was a, um, a problem I did um, before. So, or this come up in a previous lecture. Um, but what I have here is um, I have a distribution that shows the number of people who live per household, okay? And this first one here is the, I'm sorry, actually this one might not have come up. This might've been, um, or I might've skipped through it really quickly. Um, but this is the population uh, distribution for number of people per household, okay? What type of uh, histogram does this look like? Like how would you classify this population data? Right skewed. Yep, uh, so this looks right skewed. Would you mind just, I'm sorry, right skewed means what again? Do you notice how it has like this little tail that shoots off to the right that yes. gets smaller and smaller? That's the skew? That's the right skew. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, no problem. So let's just imagine that this is the actual real value, the real distribution of the data. Okay, so it looks like the vast majority of households have between one and two people in them. And then as you add more and more people, it gets a little bit skewed. It's like really hard. Okay, and the government even tries to do this with the census. Okay, but it is really hard to go to every single household in the United States and say, how many people um, live in your house? So let me ask you this. Do you think the census, even the, even the United States census is 100% correct? No. 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 Okay, what, what are two reasons why the, the United States census is not correct? Can anyone tell me? It's probably really close, but it's not 100% correct. Not everyone fills them out. Yep, that's the thing. Even though they send census takers, not everyone fills them out. Absolutely. They give the wrong answers. And then, and, and, I'm sorry, who said that? They give the wrong answers. And sometimes people give the wrong answer. Like that's, just, you know, honestly, like when we, it was really funny situation. When, our, when it came time to fill out our census, um, my wife was pregnant. So we were like, well, how many people live in our house? Is it two? Is it three? Like, I don't, what's the right answer here? <laughs> you know, he, like, Will's not here yet. Do we put two? Do we put three? Inception. Uh, so I, I think we ended up putting two because at the time, but um, uh, anyways. So the, the point is, if you look at, these are all different um, samples that were taken in orange here, okay? Um, do you notice that this is what the real population looks like? Do you notice that the samples are not 100% close to, or not 100% exactly like the population distribution? They don't like, they're not 100% match, okay? But do they look awfully close? Yes. Yes, and that's the whole point. They all look fairly close. So we use a sample. to estimate a population, okay? And the reason is in the real world, you, oftentimes you cannot collect a whole population set of data, okay? And so what you'll notice in statistics is, is like, all right, we're gonna take a sample and we know that our sample is not gonna be 100% accurate, but it's gonna be pretty close, okay? It's gonna be pretty close. So for a simple random sample, what we're seeing here is the sample distribution approximates, okay, the population distribution. And that's all we're looking to do in statistics, okay? This is the key to statistics, the key concept. Yep, I can go back. So just we use a, no problem. We use a sample to estimate a population. You okay if I go on, Jamie? 
Yes, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and so another key concept here is that you're going to notice, and this will come up a lot later when we start talking a little bit more about some of the advanced theories of the class. Um, generally, obviously, and I think this all makes sense, the, the larger your sample size, the better the approximations are. You know, if you take a sample of a thousand households, it's better than a sample of 500 households, obviously. Okay, so what I want to do before we get to our break, and I really want to do this real quickly, is I want to talk about two final um, method, visual methods for summarizing data, okay? Um, one is called dot plots and one is called a stem and leaf plot. And you'll notice if you looked at your, yep, I can go back a moment, Alexander. Uh, and you'll notice, uh, if you don't mind, as, as I go back, I'm just going to keep talking. Um, you'll notice these stem and leaf plots come up in your homework. Uh, so you'll be able to do um, uh, those questions, you know, right after, right after class here. All right, Alexander, are you okay if I go on? Yep. Oh, perfect. 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 So the first one I'm going to talk about is a dot plot. Okay. And it's a super simple concept here. Okay. So a dot plot is a graph in which each observation is plotted as a dot at an appropriate place above, above a horizontal axis, okay? So observations having equal values are stacked vertically, okay? So really what it does is dot plots kind of look like histograms a little bit um, or single value histograms, kind of what they're, they're gonna look like here. So to construct a dot plot, I'm gonna go through a visual example and then we'll do one together, so don't stress. Uh, you're going to draw a horizontal axis that displays the possible values of your data here. You're going to record each observation by placing a dot over the appropriate value. And then you're just going to label the horizontal axis with the name of the variable. It's very straightforward. So here's just kind of a, like a silly example here. Okay, this is prices and dollars of 16 DVD players. Okay, do they can you even buy a DVD player anymore? That's how, that shows you how old some of this stuff is. I believe you can. Maybe Blu-ray would be better. Blu-ray, yeah. Do people even buy Blu-rays anymore though? I don't know, I, everything is streaming. But anyways, if you look here, this is, this is all a dot plot does. Maybe, maybe, maybe Amazon, I don't know. Um, so the first value here, it looks like is $210. So what you would do is you'd have this horizontal axis of, of values. And then at 210, you would put a little dot above 210. Then you'd go to 224. Here's 220, one, two, here's 224. You'd put a little dot. And you keep doing this. At 208 here, you put another dot. And you'll notice like when you get to a, a, a value that comes up again, like here's another, here's another 210, you would just put another dot right above where you had it. That's it, that's all a dot plot is. And it just shows like how the values are dispersed. Okay, visually, that's it. That's all it does. Vis shows how the values are dispersed visually across a number line. So this was data from a previous example. Uh, this was the last problem we did at the end of class last time. Okay, if you guys remember this um, uh, heat example, it was like daily high temperatures. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So all I'm going to do is let's just do really, really quickly the dot plot for this, just so you, just so you can see how you would do it on your homework. So on your homework, you'll notice that I put the number line for you. So all you're going to do is you take the first value, which is 12, and you're going to put, you're going to go 10, 11, you're going to go to 12, you're going to put a dot. Then you go to 13, you're going to put another dot. You're going to go to 17, 15, 16. 17, you're going to put another dot, and so on, 21. And then when you get to 24, you'll notice there's two of them. You're going to put, oh, I put 24, put them on top of each other. 24, you're going to put right there. 26, then there's two 27s, six. So you'd put the two dots on top of each other. 30, 32, 35. 36, 37, 38, 41, 43, 
41, 42, 43, 44, 46, 53, and on the last value is 58. And that's all the dot plot is. It's just, just putting these, these dots in above the number line where they would occur. Okay, so you'll have to do this for the um, uh, age of the, the signers of the Declaration of Independence. That's your homework problem. Okay, so I know I went through that pretty quickly, but it's 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 I think it's pretty straightforward to do. Think you can handle this on your homework? I think so. I hope so. <laughs> Robert, you're going to do fine. Yes, we can. Yeah, good, good, good. All right. Dot plots are are um, very common ways to, uh, that you'll that that data is shown um, visually. But now I want to just end end before a break talking about these stem and leaf diagrams. Um, these are not as common, um, but we'll we'll still we'll still spend a couple minutes. Um. How would you do it in a word? So you can do it by hand. Um, I can, you can also do it if you Google, and this is if, if people are interested, I'm not gonna spend too much time cl uh, class on it, but uh, you can do it in, in Microsoft Excel. There's a, there's a way you can do it using a scatter plot. Um, so I encourage you to, to, to Google that if you're interested in, in, in seeing that. Uh, otherwise do it by hand and take a picture of it. Is that, is that okay to answer your question? That's better. Yeah, I wish, you know, I, it stinks being virtual, you know, remote, but that's just how it is. Um, okay, so finally, uh, stem and leaf diagram. Um, so each observation is separated into two parts, okay? You have what's called a stem, which is the rightmost digit, and you have a leaf, which is called the leftmost digit, okay? And think of this as like a tree, okay? Obviously kind of what I, you go with the stem and leaf part of it here. Okay, so think of each observation as a, as a stem consisting of all but the rightmost digit and that's the leaf, okay? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna write the stems from smallest to largest in a vertical column to the left of the vertical, of a vertical line then what you're gonna do is you're gonna write each leaf to the right of this, what they call vertical rule in a row that contains the appropriate stem. And then you're just gonna arrange the leaves in each row in ascending order. And I know when you see this, it's like, what the heck are you talking about with this? Um, it's like one of those, One of those things where like, um, and you'll notice this a lot in this class, it's super confusing at first. And then after you see me do one example, uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be incredibly easy. Okay. So here, this is an old data set that we had. It was one of the first things we looked at was days of maturity for 40 short-term investments. And do you notice how they're all, all two digits here? Does everyone see that? They're all two digits. So let's like take this first number, 70, okay? The first digit here is what we call the stem. And the second digit is what we call the leaf. So the way you would do this by hand, you would go, okay, you take your first number. Okay, I got a 70, okay? That's my first stem. And then it's leaf is the number zero. Then you go to your next digit, 62. Well, the stem is the first digit, six, and the leaf is a two. Then when you get to the 75, okay, do you notice how you already have a stem for the seven? You would just say, okay, well, the seven has another, another leaf. It has a five. And you would keep going through this. 57, well, I need a new stem five, and it has a leaf of seven. Then when I get to 51, there's already a stem for five. I need a new leaf of one. And then after you do that, all you have to do is make sure you take your leaves and then arrange them 
in ascending order. And that's it, that's all you have to do. Do you guys wanna see, uh, before we go to break, you wanna do, wanna do one by hand together so you can see how to do it instead of just a visual here? Yes. 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 Don't worry about this, um, this right here. This is, it's not even gonna be on your homework. So let's just ignore this for now, just to save some time. Okay, so we've been working with this uh, insulation one, okay? So I have the, these 20 data values, okay? And it's already put in ascending order for you, which makes it easy. So what I'm gonna do to do this by hand is I'm gonna create a, a table, a two column table that has the stem in the leaf. All right, so whenever you look at these two digit numbers, the first number is the stem and the second number here is the leaf. Okay, so you take the number 12, you would say, okay, it has a stem of one and a leaf of two. Then you would go to 13. Okay, do you notice how I already have a stem of one? So I'm going to add another leaf of three. I go to 17, I have the number one, and I'm gonna have a leaf of seven. Now, when I go to 21, I'm gonna need a new stem because I have the new digit two, and then it has a leaf of one. When I go to 24, stem, leaf of four. I have another 24, so I put another leaf. Do you guys see what I'm doing here? Yes. So then I have 227, so I need two leaves of seven. Now, as I go to the 30s, I have a stem of three, a leaf of zero, a leaf of two, five, seven, eight. No problem. And then when I get to the 40s, stem of four, a leaf of one, three, four, six. And then when I get to the fives, I have a leaf of three and then a leaf of eight. And that's it, that's your stem and leaf. What's really interesting about this, and I'm gonna come back to it real quickly, is look at, look at the shape of the, the leaves here. If you go back, it actually looks like our histogram just thrown on its side. Low, high, lower, lower, lower. Low, high, lower, lower, lower. So that's that's the benefit of a stem and leaf diagram. You can see the distribution, but um, it actually just has the, all the numbers there for you to see. This one, Professor, is given to us in an ascending order. So if it is mixed up, we just have to rearrange it. In yeah, that's on, that's, on, that's on you to rearrange it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, like the one on the um, the ages of the dec the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. All right. Um, so I've been going for fifty minutes. This is actually a good place to stop uh, as we go to break. Does anybody have any any questions about any of that before we go to break? All good. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll be back at 2 p.m. Uh, so I'll leave my clock up here so you can, so that you can see it. Uh, I'm gonna go refill my coffee, um, but otherwise enjoy, well, I guess it's really like a nine minute or an eight minute, 30 second break now, but enjoy your break and I'll be back at 2 p.m. sharp.
All right, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. So I want to um, uh, finish up today. Um, I want to get through, if you log, look into the uh, classroom here under course content, under week two, I'm going to start this um, lecture number three. And then on Thursday, what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to be able to get through, uh, finish lecture number three uh, and lecture number four. Okay. And then if I don't get to lecture number five on Thursday, I'll just cover it next week. It's like a 10 minute lecture, if that. Okay, so if you haven't downloaded this, just print it out. Um, and I wanna get through at least in this first hour, uh, yeah, first 20, 25 slides or so, depends in this next hour, I mean. Okay, uh, and everybody can see my screen again just fine, right? Still yeah. good? Okay. It's the PowerPoint up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it little bit good. Yeah, okay. So what we want to do now, um, uh, we want to move into uh, numerical measures of data. Okay, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, these um, calculations in general, These, at least these initial ones. Um, the one thing I will say is... Um, has everybody gotten their TI calculator yet? Is there anybody who doesn't have it? I mean, for the, people have their TI-83 or TI-84 calculators? I'm still waiting for mine to uh, come in the mail. Okay. Um, we're going to start using them. I hope, you're, I hope yours comes soon. Uh, we're going to start using them uh, a lot uh, towards the end of class on Thursday, and then a ton. We're going to use them a ton um, next week. Okay. So I hope... I hope your, your calculators come before next week. I hope like uh, um, those of you who haven't gotten it, you, I don't know, write, write the sellers or something and be like, send me my TI calculator. <laughs> but I do know mail's running slow these days. Um, but if you do have it, just, just have it. Uh, the TI, um, uh, the TI I Inspire, I don't know how to use Philip, um, but what the, the calculators are easy to use uh, yeah. and I'm gonna, I'm gonna load up an emulator so you'll see me pressing the same button so you'll be able to follow along and we're gonna get a ton of practice with it, okay? I've had this one since high school because it was a requirement, so I know how to use it. I just okay. want to be okay with you. Uh, say that again, say that again, Philip. I said, I know how to use it because I've had it since high school because it was okay. a requirement. Is it okay with you if I have this one? Yeah, I don't know anything about, honestly, I don't know anything about the TN Inspire. So if it, it can do the same stuff that you see me do, that's great, you know? Okay, just, cool. you, you'll just have to, to like Google how to do stuff if it doesn't make sense. Okay. All right. So now we're going to move into numerical measures for data. And so the, the first set of numerical measures I want to talk about are measures of what are called central tendency. So uh, we're going to look at three different concepts of central tendency. And what they try to do is they try to describe a typical element of a data set. So you're going to hear these things called the mean, median, and mode, the three M's. And I'm sure you've all heard of them before. Um, but what is the mean synonymous with? What word that starts with A? Average. Yep. OK. The median, when you think of the median of a data set, does anybody know what that kind of means? The middle. The middle. middle, yeah. And um, what does the mode generally mean? The most occurring. Yep, the most observed, yep. All right, so I'm gonna talk about these um, data sets with you. And so the first one I wanna talk about is the mean. And there are two means in this class and uh, the notation, how you, know, how you take an average is really easy, right? Like if I were to say there's 29 of us on the call if I wanted to say, you know, how many hours of TV did we watch last night on average, I would just ask everybody, sum up how many of us, you know, sum up everybody's responses and divide by how many there are. Like that's, that's all in averages. But what's important here is this subtle notation because this subtle notation comes up a lot. Okay, so if X sub one, the first one is called, it's called a population mean. So if X sub one, what this just means is the first observation, 
X sub two is the second observation. And X sub N are the capital N observations of a variable from a population. So just recall that capital N stands for the population size. Okay, that's all capital N is. Then the population mean, which we denote with this Greek letter. Okay, so this is the Greek letter mu. Okay, so you'll, mu is how you say it, is given by, so all you're gonna do, you're gonna take the first variable, sum up, add it, add it to the second, all the way, you're gonna, gonna add up to get to the last one and then divide by n. So we use this shorthand notation. Uh, does anybody know what this, what this operator is in mathematics? It is a capital sigma. It is the capital Greek letter sigma. That is correct. But does anybody know? Yep, it's the sum. It's a summation. Yep. So all this means, and this is just shorthand notation. Instead of writing x1 plus x2, da, 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 we just say sum up x sub i. And what i stands for is the individual values. So sum up the individual values, divide by how many there are. That's it. So this population mean is what we call a parameter. Okay, and then just a parameter is a value calculated from a population. That's it. If x sub one, x sub two, comma x sub n are the n, now lowercase n here, this is important, lowercase n. So this is the sample size. Are the n observations, a little bit of a typo there, huh? of a variable from a sample, then the sample mean it looks like an X with a bar over it. This is literally called X bar. Okay, uh, you'll notice that uh, statisticians, uh, you know, don't, don't really have clever names for these things. Oh, X with a bar over it, let's just call it X bar. And it's given as, so this is the sample mean. X bar is equal to X1 plus X2, it's the same thing. Just, you just divide by the sample size. And this is a statistic X bar because it comes from a sample. So I just like to spend just one extra minute on this slide because it's, it's really important. Whenever you see a Greek letter, that's a parameter, comes from a population. Whenever you see something like X bar or um, something that's referenced that's not a Greek letter, that's gonna be a statistic later on. Okay, and statistics always just come from a, a sample. All right, so how do you know the subtle difference? Like when would you use mu and when would you use X bar? Um, let me show you with a real simple, real simple example, okay? Everybody okay if I go on? Okay. So here's an example of a population mean. Okay, so remember population has all the possible values. Okay, so there are three countries in North America, right? So that means the population size is three. Okay, and these are their land areas right here in kilometers squared. Um, so what is the average land area? Well, since you know all the possible values, it would be a parameter, be a Greek letter, right? There's Canada, Mexico, and us. So we'd say, well, the population mean for their average land area, we would just sum up the average land areas, divide by three, because that's how many countries there are in North America. And this is their average land area in kilometers square. So that's when you would use the Greek letter, when you have all the possible values. When would you use X bar? So just like suppose you ask 10 people uh, how many hours of TV they watched last night, and these were the responses. I watched one hour, two hours, half an hour, zero. I watched four hours, each zero, two, one, one and a half, zero, three. Uh, what does the sample mean here? Well, you know, more than 10 people watched TV, okay, last night. So this is a sample. So this would be a statistic. So you would just sum up how many hours they watched, which is 14 total, divide by there were 10 of them. So you'd say the sample mean X bar was 1.4 hours. And that's it, okay? Um, I don't think taking an average is hard, right? We've all taken averages in our life. I think what's hard is just like knowing 
you know, what notation to use. So population mean when you have complete information, um, Greek letters or uh, X bar when you don't. And I'll just give you a hint, very rarely will I ask you to ever calculate a parameter. It'll always be a statistic. So that should help you, you know, realize <clears throat> what notation to use. Okay, pretty easy, you know, just obviously taking an average, not, not hard at all, or it seems not pretty kind of straightforward. What do you, if I asked you to take an average of a data set, you guys think you could do it on a homework or on an exam? A lot of crickets, okay, or a delay there. You guys need to get some more coffee. Yes, okay. I wanna talk now about how you find the median by hand, okay? Uh, and the median um, is the midpoint of data, so the middle. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how to do this by hand. Um, later on in the next class, I'll show you how to use your calculator for all this stuff, but it, it's good to just, just practice it by hand so you can understand what's going on. Okay, so the midpoint uh, looks for data when they are sorted. I actually wrote this backwards. Um, it's actually from lowest to highest. So you're gonna sort the data from lowest to highest. Okay, and there's two ways that you need to, to, to check this when you do it by hand. When the number of observations is odd, there's an odd number of observations, it's really easy. But if there's an even number of observations in the data set, uh, it's a little bit trickier, okay? So if the number of observations is odd, then the median is the data value that is exactly in the middle of the data set, okay? That is the median is, is the observation that falls in what we call the M plus one divided by two position. So I'm gonna explain this uh, with an example to show you, okay? Um, is everybody okay if I, I'm gonna come back to this slide, but I, I wanna do, I wanna jump right into an example if the number of observations is odd, how you find this data set or how you find the median, excuse me, using this N plus one divided by two position. Everybody okay if I just do that and then come back? Okay. So look here, um, I, I have this data set here, okay? <clears throat> uh, Robert, not Robert from class, this was, this was made before this, but so we have this person named Robert and he went to Gris, uh, Grimsby driving range and he hit 11 golf balls, okay? And he recorded the distance of his drive. So this, this Robert isn't so good at golf, okay? Um, and I wanna find the median of this. Okay, so if you look here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's eleven observations. Okay, so to find the median by hand, you use this what's called n plus one divided by two position. Okay, does anybody remember what lowercase n stood for in statistics? Sample. Sample what though? There was another word after it, sample, another word that started with S. Size. Sample size, right? So how many, how many drives does he have here? He has 11. So this is my N. So it's 11 plus one divided by two, which is 12 divided by two. So what's going on here is the median is occurring in position six of the data set. So in order data, this is position one, position two, three, four, five, and look, there's position six right there. So that's the median. And that makes sense too, obviously, if you look at it, there's five observations below it, one, two, three, four, five observations above it. Now, if there's an odd number of observations is even, unfortunately, it involves just a second step. Okay, so if the number of observations is even, then the median is the mean of the two middle observations in the data set. Okay, so that is the median is the mean of the two data values 
on either side of the observation that lies in the n plus one divided by two position. <clears throat> so really what this, when there's an even number of observations, it's just an extra step. And basically what's going on here is you find the two middle numbers. And take their average. Okay, that's what's going on here. So let's go back and let's do that, okay? So here's another example here. Um, so Robert now is at uh, the, the Grimsby driving range um, and he's gonna hit 12 golf balls, okay? So I've got him in ordered data right here. So we're still gonna use this N plus one divided by two position. Okay, so now, now there's 12 golf balls that he hit. So it's 12 plus one divided by two, which gets you 13 divided by two. And does anybody know what 13 divided by two gets you? 6.5. Yep. Okay, so what this is saying is go to position 6.5 in the data set. So here's position one, two, three, four. Here's position five, here's position six, and here's position seven. If the data wasn't ordered, we would, yeah, you, you would, you got to put it in order always first. Absolutely. Yep. So position 6.5 is going to occur between these two numbers. Okay. So all you have to do then to find the median is after you find the middle two numbers, just take their average. So the median, you would take 85 plus 95 and divide it by two. So I think 85 plus 95, I think that gets you 180 divided by two. And 180 divided by two gets you 90. And that's the median. So that's it. That's all you have to do. So is it not, not too bad seeing me do these two? Uh, professor. Yeah. The mean, median, and mode, we always have to arrange them from lowest to highest. So to do an average, like to go back, you don't even need to arrange them to do an average. Like if you look here, I didn't have to do it. You know, yes. I just added them. But if you're going to do the median um, by hand, yes, you have to arrange them. Thank you. Okay. Would you guys like to see, uh, is it straightforward or would you want to see me do it once more? One more, please. All right. Can you yeah, no problem. Let me just stick an extra slide in here. So this is just an extra example I'm just gonna throw in here, okay. Oh, sorry, that was a little sloppy line there. Um, all right, let's just do an example of commute times, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, just gonna need some participation in class here, okay? Uh, let's collect, um, Let's collect some some values here. Can people when you used to, when you used to be able to go to campus? Okay, um, how long would it take you? In minutes, minutes. 35, 10, 20, 15, 15, 10, 12, 30, 15, 20, 25, and then we'll just stop there. Eight. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And I'm gonna include Taylor's there, uh, 12 for 30. Uh, actually, you know what? We'll go 35. We'll do Alexandra here, 35. And then um, I'll give you mine. When I, I live in Morristown, New Jersey. So if I if in minutes, if there's no traffic, because I have to go over the um, I still call it the Tappan Z bridge, but I guess it's the Mario Cuomo bridge. But it's the if I, uh, if I have no uh, traffic, it takes me about 65 minutes. And if it's super light and it's late at night and I can really put the pedal to the metal, I can do it in like 58, but don't, 
I'm not advocating that anybody speeds, but you know. All right, so I've got all this, this data here. It looks like I've got 14 observations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so what's the first thing we should do here? So if you're gonna find the median by hand, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna to have to order the data, okay? <clears throat> so let's, let's do that. So the lowest, whoever had an eight minute commute time, that is very nice. Then it looked like there were two tens. Uh, then 12, then a 15 and then another 15. And then it looked like there were two 20s. And then it looked like a 25 and then a 30 and then two 35s and then my commute time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Oh, did I miss one? I think you missed a 30. I missed a 30. Yes, I did. 30, then a 35. And then my 65. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. I actually, you know what? I did that on purpose just to see who was paying attention. So well done. Okay. Um, so then the next thing you would do is you would take this n minus n plus one divided by two position. So n plus one divided by two gets me 14 plus one divided by two. 15 divided by two. So the median is going to occur in position 7.5. So here's position one, here's position two, three, four, five, six. Well, here's seven. <laughs> here's position eight. Okay, so the median is going to occur between these two numbers here. Well, what is the average of 20 and 20? It's just 20. So in this case, you had the same number on either side. So the median is still just what's the average of those two, which is 20. All right, what do you think? Extra example was good? Awesome. Yeah, I don't want you to get too stressed out about it. Um, I don't want to spend too much time doing more examples because uh, what, what you're going to notice in this class is every, Oftentimes, I'm just going to do one example by hand, just so you can kind of see where the calculation is going. And then I'll be like, okay, well, you know what, your calculator does it for you very easily. So let's, let's learn that. Um, the reason being, because like in the real world, statisticians just do not do this stuff by hand. They, what's really important is to be able to draw conclusions from data. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time. So like these menial tasks of finding the median, we're eventually just going to have our calculator and stuff do. Okay, uh, and move on. Uh, so the mode is just the most observed. So here's an example. This is actually with qualitative data, but if you have 20 opinions of the Hillwood Cafe, the response fair is the most common. So we would say that's the mode. Uh, let me give you a numerical example. If you have this data set, the numbers five, six, seven, 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 eight, ten, twelve, and twelve. What's the mode of this data set here? What's the VOD observation that occurs the most? Seven. Yep. Yep. And then what if you have this one here? The second example. If you have a data set that just has the numbers uh, two, three, four, five, and six, there's actually two correct answers here. Wouldn't that be three Say that and, louder. Like three and six and two and four. Uh, three and six. Two. So if you look here, the numbers. So does any number occur more than any other number in the in the data set two, three, four, five, and six? No. No. So there's here's what you can say. You could say there is no mode. Or you can also say they're all the mode. So the mode doesn't have to be unique. 
because they all occur one time, which is the most. So this is one, this is, this is an example of like why the mode is just not a good, um, a good measure of central tendency. And it's actually, it's like never reported. If you look at, you know, data set analysis, um, it just, no one will ever really report the mode. It's always, you know, what is the median of the data set here? And what is the average? Okay, those are the two most important ones, okay? And this mode is just not really useful. Okay. I think what I wanna end on, I think we have time to cover it is this, um, this, this, this topic called um, the weighted mean. Okay, so this is, this is where we'll shoot to, uh, uh, maybe I'll be able to get to the range too. All right, so the weighted mean. So this is, a, this is some type of average. So this is also synonymous with a weighted average. Uh, no problem. I just got a private message. Yeah, no problem. Don't worry about it. All right, so weighted average here. So this weighted mean occurs um, when you have some observation in your data set that you wish to place more importance on than others. So you so you have this data set and just there's there's some observations that are more important. Okay. So if you if you have some observations that are more important, um, you have to have what's called a weighting variable. And this weighting variable indicates the importance to place on a given observation, okay? So this weighted mean is gonna have two, two variables actually associated with it. We have the original variable that we're gonna denote by X sub I, and we're gonna have a weighting variable denoted by W sub I, okay? And it's gonna seem, the formula is gonna seem a little confusing at first, um, but, um, but after we work two examples, I think it'll make sense. I think everyone will be like, okay, I kind of got this. So this is the formula for a weighted mean. Okay, so the weighted mean is always just gonna be denoted as X bar W. Okay, so that just tells you it's the mean weighted. Okay, there's no mu sub W, it's always just X bar W. And I'm gonna actually write it a little bit backwards from here, okay? Um, so a weighted mean is a division problem. So you're gonna notice here that I'm gonna take some things and I'm gonna multiply them together. So you take your first variable, x sub one, and you multiply it by its corresponding weighting variable, w sub one. Then you're gonna to add to it, okay? You're gonna take your second variable in your data set, x sub two, and you're gonna multiply it by its corresponding weighting variable w sub two. And you're gonna keep doing this so until you get to the last variable that you have multiplied by its weighting variable, okay? So you're gonna get some big numbers when you do this. Well, it depends on the example, relatively big. And in shorthand notation, I'll come to the denominator in a second. This, you're gonna have your summation so you're gonna sum up, instead of writing it out like this, you're gonna sum up each X variable, each X sub I times this corresponding W sub I, okay? You guys can hear my son, huh? A little bit, just to kind of- Don't worry about it. Oh, I'm not, I, I appreciate you telling me that. Uh, He's a healthy he, boy. He hates napping. He, it's so crazy. He just was like, every time he was going to go down for a nap, he just, he was just like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so the dividing, this is where it gets a little weird. And I'll show you why we need to do this in a, in a second. Um, you don't divide by how many observations there are. Instead, you divide by the sum of the weighting variables. So it's the sum of the weighting variables. So actually, um, and I'm just gonna go back for a second in the slide. So just bear with me and I'll come right back to this. Um, this formula here, both of these formulas, they're called an arithmetic mean. 
And they're actually just a waiting mean, a waiting, a weighted mean, but just every waiting variable, every W is equal to one. Okay, so every every variable has the same weight. Um, this formula here is when we have variables that are that we want to put more importance on than others. Okay. So the formula looks a little confusing. I, I believe me. Like the first time you see this, it's like, what? But um, it's actually, once you see two examples, it's, it's really straightforward. Okay, so why would we have, why would we need this weighted mean? Um, is everybody okay if I go to the next slide? Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, don't worry about copying down numbers. Just, just pay attention to this. Uh, so this data is a little old, um, but this, 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 I think this data is maybe 10, 12 years old. So the, the, the life expectancy has obviously gotten better. But when I made this, it tells you how long I've been teaching. <laughs> um, I had this, this group of Northern African countries. The only reason I picked this data set was because I came across it in, a, in an article I was reading. Um, so I have these countries here, Algeria, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Nigeria, Sudan, and Tunisia, Tunisia, not Tunisia, Tunisia. Uh, and they have their corresponding life expectancies of each. Uh, who has the highest life expectancy does it look like? Tunisia. No, uh, yeah, Libya. Libya, right? Libya has, the people who live in Libya, their life expectancy of 73. Uh, who has the lowest life expectancy? Nigeria. Yeah, look at that. I think that's a little whoosh. Okay. So suppose you wanted to take the average life expectancy, okay, in these in the, this group of northern African countries. So all you would do is you would just take up the seven uh, seven life expectancies, which sum to four twenty two, and divide by seven, and you would get that the average life expectancy here is sixty three point one four. Okay. Now this is this is a life expectancy where we're counting every 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 variable here life expectancy the same. We're weighting them the same. Now let me give you an additional piece of information. All right, here's the population of each country. Okay. Uh, who has the lowest population? Libya. Yeah, only 5 million people live in Libya, okay. Uh, but they have the highest life expectancy and who has the highest population? Nigeria, Nigeria right? Um, so let me ask you this. Why is it unfair if we wanted to get a more accurate picture of life expectancy in Northern African countries here? Uh, why would it be unfair to just do a straight mean? Well, do. Do like a, a ton more people live in Nigeria than Libya? Yes. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 25 times more, okay? Um, so do you think we should place more importance on this number than this number? So is this more important? And that this number here is the least important because the least number of people do? live there? Would you guys agree on that? Yeah, you want the highest number with a better... Yeah, like, let me just turn my volume. Okay. Yeah, like, it, it, more people live in Nigeria than live in Libya, so we want to place more importance on that, okay? So the one thing that's the, that you have to do, and this is a little bit tricky, is when you have um, uh, a weighted mean, your weights are not numbers like one, two, three, four. That's not how weighting variables work, okay? So I have two variables here. I have life expectancy and population. Okay, which was my original variable that I was interested in? I was interested in life expectancy, right? So this is my original variable, X sub I, okay? And then I'm gonna pick this other variable population and that's what I'm gonna weight it by, okay? So basically what's going on here is I'm gonna say, look, Libya, you have a weight of five, whereas Nigeria, you have a weight of 126. That's how you're gonna pick your weighting variable, okay? So then I'm gonna to go to the next slide here. So this was my X variable and this was my weighting variable. 
So a weighted mean, let me put the formula at the top here, okay? X bar weighted. It was the sum of each X value times its corresponding weight divided by the sum of the weights, okay? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take each X value and you're gonna multiply by its weight. So if you were to take 68 times 31, you would get this number. Then you'd go to Egypt, you would take 66 times 70 and you would get this number. 73 times five, you get 365 and you're gonna keep going. And then what you would do here after, this is what I've done in this column here. Okay, I've taken the original variable x sub i and multiplied by its corresponding weights, okay? So then this top part here says sum up each x value times its corresponding weights. Well, this number here is the sum of all these. So your numerator gets replaced with 16,627. Now you have to divide by something. So there, there are seven countries here. What you would not do is divide by seven. Okay, because you'd take this and divide by seven, you'd get a number greater than 2000, which would be like, that doesn't make any sense. So you'd have to divide by the sum of the weights. Well, this is my weighting variable population. So it looks like there were 302 million people who lived in these seven countries. So when you take this and divide it by the sum of your weights, you get a more accurate description of the average life expectancy, okay? Weighted by population. So let me ask you this, does it at least make sense uh, why we would need a weighted mean? This looks better than the other one. Yeah, yeah, does it like, I think it makes sense why you would need this in this case, right? Because so many more people live in Nigeria than Libya in this case, right? So like, it, it, it's, it's, it's really important to, to do a weighted mean here. All right, how about with the time we have left, I do one more example of this. Uh, one that you guys, a little bit, little bit easier numbers, okay? Is everybody okay if I go to the next slide here? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir, yeah. All right, so what we're going to do with the time we have left um, is we're going to calculate the GPA for a student, okay? And um, I want to talk about maybe why this might actually be a weighted mean, okay? So we have this student, Matt. Okay. And let me tell you the classes that Matt is taking. Okay. Time does go by fast. Yes, um, we're almost done. Um, the private message I'm just responding to. Uh, so we got this student, Matt. Um, he's taken some classes. What do you think the most important class you could take is, though? Stats 140. Yeah. Uh, Agreed. Yes, he's absolutely taking statistics. Jeez, of course, that's the most important class anybody could take. Yeah, come on. So he's taking a stats class. Let's say he's also taking a calculus class. That's fun. He's taking an economics class. Biochemistry. Uh, let's no. Let's let's. That's a little too hard for me. I mean, math in quotations. English, and then he's also taking a running class. Okay. These are the courses he's taken. Matt's taken five classes, stats, calculus, economics, English, and running. All right, let me give you his letter grade in each. Okay, what do you think he gets in statistics? A. I mean, obviously he's gonna get an A, come on. Uh, let's just say he gets a B in calculus, Ooh, okay. He gets a B in economics. A in English. Ah, uh, I was actually, let's give him a C in English. Okay, it's not too good in that. And he's taking a running class and poor Matt, he gets a D in running. Ooh. I know, I know he's not very good running. 
So let's change this. If you, if you look at your GPA, right? GPA is calculated on a four point scale. I don't like running, I agree. Okay. Although my wife and I, we own a Peloton and that's pretty good. So maybe it should have been biking. Um, on a four point scale, yeah, Peloton's great. A little expensive though. Um, on a four point scale, does anyone know what an A is worth? Four. Yep. four. Yep, okay. So on a four point scale, does anyone know what a B is worth? Three. Yep, a B plus is worth 3.33. B minus is worth uh, 2.7. Uh, so B here, does anyone know what a C is worth? Two. Yep, and then a D? One. One, okay. So now here's the thing. If you were to just take, or grade, if you were to just take the average of this, okay? Four plus three plus three plus two plus one, and he's taken five classes. What do we get here? Gosh, four, seven, 10, we get 13 divided by five, which I think would become a 2.6, okay? Pretty sure that's a 2.6. I'll just confirm it real quick. Yeah, okay. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that's the actual GPA reported to the student? No. Okay, why not? Because running has less value. Right, that's exactly it, right? I agree, I agree with you, Robert, right? So like, there's, there's all these classes here and, and we have to decide, look, obviously the running course is the least important class of all of them, okay? I personally think statistics is the most important. I'm sure other people would disagree, but so we wanna weight this somehow. And then just out of curiosity, does anybody know how the college chooses to weight courses for your GPA? Anybody got it? Nope. No? Oh, they can. Right there, Ken's got it, or Kenneth, if, however you prefer it, me to call you. But they do it by credits, actually. Kenny, I got you, Kenny. Okay. So this is credits, believe it or not. They choose to wait by credits. So statistics, how many credit courses is this one? Right, you're all in it. You should know. It's a, it's a four credit course, right? Calculus is generally a four credit course. Economics class is a three credit course. English tends to be a three credit course. Now, a running course, a, a phys ed course, how many credits do those generally be? One. Yeah, one credit, okay. So what we're saying here is look, the grade of A in statistics, we're gonna weight by four and the grade of D of running, we're gonna weight by one, okay? So now we wanna find our weighted mean. Okay, so just so we're clear, the formula here is the sum of each x value times its weight divided by the sum of the weights. So our number grade, that's our original variable. That's our x sub i. And the credits is our w sub i, our weighting variable. So to help here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new column called uh, x sub i times w sub i. Okay. So you're going to multiply just across. So you're going to go four times four gets me 16. Three times four gets me 12. Three times three gets me nine. Two times three gets me six. And one times one gets me one. All right. So now what I have to do, just looking at our formula here, is the sum of each x variable times the weight. So you have to sum this column up. So 16 and 12, 28, 37. Oh gosh, why am I so bad at math? Uh, 43, 44, I think this sums up too. Did anybody do that and just verify my number there? Did I do that right? One thing you never want to hear from your math teacher, why am I so bad at math? The numbers are good. Thank you. And now I have to sum up the weighting variables. Well, how many, how many weights did he have here? Well, he had 15 credits, it looks like, right? Four, eight, 11, 14. 
the student Matt was taking 15 credits. So you divide it by 15. And the real GPA the student get, would get reported to them would be 2.93. So actually I encourage you all when you get your, um, when you get your grade report at the end of the semester and they report to you your GPA, you should check to make sure they do it right. Okay. Like when I was in college, I would do that. I would always check my, my, my grade and I'd be like, ah, oh, dang it, they got it right. Um, so good question, Jamie. So generally um, that's the hardest part for some of these problems. Um, but like if, we're, if we wanna calculate the grade point average, so the, it's kind of telling you that the, the X is the grade because that's what you're interested in. Like up here, if you look going back real quick, I want to find the average life expectancy. So, so whatever, what originally you're looking for, that's your X sub I. And then your other column tends to be your weighting variable. So there's no weighted mean question on, on your homework due this week, but uh, your, your homework number two, you, I'll put one of these on there for you to practice. All right, what did you, class okay today? It was a good spot to end. Yes. I like it went well. It's a yeah, I'll be, it's a little dry. I think I tried telling you guys that, that um, you know, the, 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 this stuff was, it's, it's a little, bleh, but uh, it, it does get more interesting. So next class we'll pick up exactly here. Um, so on Thursday, I'll do measures of dispersion and, um, uh, measures of dispersion. Then we'll start this five number summary. We'll actually do that entire lecture too. All right, class, uh, let me stop the recording.